was ahead of this one. What's the same guy that the woman left? That was a dinner party with Lefty. And she went on for like 47 seconds. Felt like it was forever before the camera cut out. And I started feeling a little nervous now. Thinking that this gotta go sideways, right? Like anybody filming this or safe in this film, it gotta be something crazy that happened. Cause I'm gonna save some film where nothing happened, right? It's like I was watching a television show, you know, I wanted to see where this was headed. So, you know, still I was a little nervous, but not like, like, oh my God, I need to call the police. I decided to keep going. Now the third video was, of course, called Zero Zero Three. And this was the one that got me officially, like, tripping, man. The clip started from the same shaky hands as the first clip. And it was pouring rain outside the car. And I could barely make out a figure in a fur coat with an umbrella walking to the front door of a house. And I could only assume, like, who this person was and who else this belonged to. And if it could enter the house, I closed the door. Now, after following, like, I mean, I mean, dude, like, after the, 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 what came after this was just nothing, like, just sitting there. I 
talking from. It made me feel a lot better, but it didn't really prove anything. I don't want a full video when games on the end. I was wondering whether or not I was prepared to see what came next. I gonna hope that this was a prank or at least had a happy ending. Or, you know, maybe it's just something I saw, but don't really understand, you know. Now 005 began inside the house, and it was dark, like extremely dark. And the only thing I could make out was a figure that would occasionally walk in front of the camera. It was real quiet too for the first few, like 11 minutes, seconds. Now, right as you could hear, like a dog barking outside. Then eventually, like the small sound started to hear come up. Now the small sound sound started to be like loud, muffled scream. And shaking and struggling sounds became more apparent as time went on. And I guess some crying. And then a light came on. And the camera was lifted and it was moved to the center of the room. And it showed this lady with blood and stuff on her tied to a chair. And from what I could make out, this was in fact the woman from the bar. And the camera zoomed in on her face for what seemed like an eternity before stopping. And I couldn't believe this was happening. The original hope was that this movie or something like it, it you know, it was just long gone, man. With only one video remaining, I was beginning to fear for my own safety. I locked my door, closed my blinds, and went on. I turned on 006 with a small hope that this one was still alive and that I could have her saved. And the final part of this horror show began in the bathroom. And the camera was placed on the counter face in the mirror in which I could see the door. The only sound I could make it was a familiar sound that destroyed my hopes. It sounded like like it's some power tools or something. And I sat in the screen for like fit where I was before the sound stopped. Then it was quiet. Then heavy footsteps and it sounded like something being dragged. And the door knob turned and the door was pushed open. And then out of the darkness of the rest of the house appeared a middle-aged woman dressed in what I could only like say it was like some lab stuff, sporting a respirator and a pair of long rubber gloves. And this like gave me a small like amount of relief. In a reflection, the woman struggled to drag something to the bathtub. And as she put it in the tub, I could see it was a big black garbage bag. I felt like I was dreaming, like it was like watching a horror movie unfolding on the screen. And she lifted the bag up from the tub and it was empty except for like whatever, like st stuff still was dropped out. And she picked up the camera and placed it on the ground facing the tub. And on the floor of the tub was a bunch of like, some, like chemicals and stuff. It was empty containers and stuff. And the woman began to dump the liquids in the tub. And it was this noise. And it was like, it sounded like pop rocks and stuff. Mixed with like some, some Coca-Cola or something. And the video was done. And I was just sitting there looking crazy. And my heart was beating all fast. And then I opened up the, it was a photo with some pictures on it. And a picture of a truck and a picture of a girl. Like in the third picture brought up a corrupted foul notice. But that might have been a good thing. I managed to keep the two pictures before I handed the laptop over to the police. And they gave me about my six hundred along with a bonus apparently. The victim was the young girlfriend of the older woman's ex husband. The older woman was arrested almost a year before, but was freed of all charges due to lack of evidence, and her ex-husband was put in jail instead. I guess this was the missing link. I hope this has any solved any unanswered questions. Although I'm not sure who the man in the flannel jacket was, or how he got a hold of the laptop, or how he owns the same trick as the murderer. But me, I'm just gonna leave that. So he might got the hang job, so <laughs> to get my money back. And uh y'all y'all both leave for figure that junk out. That's what y'all get paid all the big money for.
This story is called The Strangers. My name is Andrew Eriks. I lived once in a city called New York, and my mother is Terry Eriks. She's in the phone book. If you know the city and you read this, find her. Don't show her this, but tell her I love her. That I'm trying to come home, please. It all started when I decided around the same time that I turned 25 that it was time for me to give up talking or taking my backpack in and work. And it would make me look more mature, I thought, if I'm all looking around a book bag everywhere like a high school student. Of course, this meant I had to give up reading in the subway in the mornings and afternoons since I suddenly couldn't quite fit my paper bags into a pocket. A brief case uh, I would have been out of line since I was working at a factory and messenger bags always seemed a little, you know, like a little fruity to me. You know, it's too much like a purse, man. <laughs> and this bag, you know, I had an MP3 player and it'd be passing time for a while, but when it broke, it would shut down at the end of every song if I didn't skip to the next track manually. I gave that up too. So every morning I sit up on the train for a half hour that dragged on endlessly with nothing at all to do but watch all the folks. I was kind of shy, so I didn't like to be caught, you know, looking at folk. So I just like kind of watch people on the low. And interestingly enough, I quickly discovered that I wasn't the only person in the world who was uncomfortable in public. Now people covered it up all kinds of different ways, but I learned to see through them. I divided them up into categories in my head. It was the fidgeters who couldn't get comfortable constantly moving their hands, shifting their weight, moving their legs closer to the bench near further away, and they were most like noticeably nervous types. After them were the fake sleepers who took their seat and practically closed their eyes in the same second. Most of them weren't really sleeping though. The real sleepers shifted more. Came awake suddenly and stops after loud noise and stuff. The face just zoned from the second that they until, like the moment the train poured until they stop and they just magically wake up. Then there were the MP3 player addicts, the occasional laptop people, the people who traveled in groups and talked too loud. The cell phone junkies were either very popular or just completely unable to shut up for more than two minutes at a time. You know, this back when people actually talked on their phone. Yeah, just as people watching was straightening to get unbearably bored, I found my first, like, exciting, real, like, exciting moment, man. A middle aged looking man, brown hair, every size and weight, and dressed casually. Like, not weird enough, man. He seemed almost like too normal. It wasn't nothing remarkable about that man, no mannerisms. And if it, you know, it's like he was made to just, like, hide in the crowd. And that's what made me notice him was the fact that I, like, I noticeable that man was, man. I was, like, intentionally trying to see how people acted on the subway. And he didn't act at all. Didn't even react either. It was like seeing somebody sitting in front of the TV. Watching a documentary about fish. They ain't excited. They ain't engaged. But they ain't looking away either. Like it's like you was pressing, but not accounted for. He was on the subway in the afternoons, and it was more than a month into the people watching experiment before he caught my eye. Because I didn't catch the same sub every day. And then I'm um, consciously sitting in the same car when I did. I saw him for the first time on Monday, I believe. And for the first time, and for the second time, on like Thursday that same week, he obviously did catch the same train and sat in the same car, in the same seat even, man. Like, this guy must get like crazy OCD, man. I thought at the time, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Since he got my attention so much that first time, I watched him more. Like, even harder the second time, I ain't really look at nobody else. And this guy was just, he made me just, just made me nervous. <laughs> he didn't do anything, he just sat there expressionless, head straight, no matter what happened. <laughs>
reached my stop, I found myself just, you know, feeling a little sick, man. And when I got out the car, my hands were shaking like I was having like a, like a, like withdrawals or something, man. Something about that man was wrong. And you know, I'm not like no punk, man, so it ain't like, I'm scared of him, like he, like he could beat me up or something, man. But it's just something about that man, man. Like it got, must be some kind of whatever sociopath is, they gotta be him. Like maybe he's one of those quiet guys who turn out, he got like chopped up heads and stuff in his refrigerator, man. And it all started with killing his mama from from her treating him like a baby until he was a grown man. You know, that's how this guy, that's the kind of vibes he gave me. But then again, I watched so much crazy horror stuff that I always didn't go, you know, take it extreme in a lot of situations. Now I found myself, like, intentionally messing around after work in the afternoons, stopping to browse in the mall and stuff near the subway, even when I didn't intend on buying nothing. For a couple of weeks, I avoided catching that subway, and when I found myself at the stop, when it was pulling in, I made sure to choose a train car. It's far from the one I seen him in. Then one morning, I saw another person who set off, set off the same light warning bells in my head. It was a woman, just as plain looking and out of place, and the hustle and commotion around her as that guy was, man. In a moment, I recognized how I realized later, um, you know, when my obsession with this stuff began. Like my people watching, which it started as a bit of a hobby to stay involved, like my boredom became something I felt like a religion to me almost. I couldn't enter a subway or ride a bus without finding myself examining everybody, filling out a mental checklist in my head, plain clothes of solid colors, no brands, check, no expressions, no casual glances out the window or towards other people, check, no bags, purses, or accessories, check, check. Certain things because the 
just look wrong to us. You know, they just look alien. That was the effect that the strangers were starting to have on me. They just mess with my senses, man. It's like how just when somebody see a bug, they get chills and stuff run down their spine. So, I'll follow them again the next day and again the day after that. And every day for at least a week, the two of us made out little quiet little trips together. And, and um, don't, you know, I'm the only one that knew it. Uh, he didn't know, of course. But by the end of the week, I was following him for hours until the last train that stopped that near my apartment block that night. We rode from one end of the city to the other, then back again. And I wanted people watching. I was just a person watching, a stranger watching. I didn't have eyes for anybody else. And uh, through my light peripherals, I noticed there was a few confused glances sent my way. Other than that, we two might have been the only two people on that planet for all I care. I lost my job the next week. My manager was nice and timid, but you know, real firm though. Said I wasn't concentrating, I had no focus. Wasn't being anywhere near productive. I was actually it was actually like a real like motivational speech, man. I think, but I could barely hear it. All I could think about was my New York new work, I mean, you know, my my new late purpose, man. What would that man do? You know, that thing on the subway get up to when I wasn't there to keep an eye on him. I left work for the last time at noon that day. Normally I started telling that man at 5 30, but I was sure that he'd be waiting for me. I wish now that I paid more attention to that day. Was it a sunny day? It was summertime. I could have walked around downtown, maybe checked out some fine girls or something. Could have had an ice, you know, cappuccino, and a, you know, a nice uh, order of rib tips or something, man. <laughs> you know, then I got went to the crib and put my put my addiction out of my head. And found a new job, you know. And got back to the old me and spent my time on the train, reading and listening to music and stuff. Then. And they're getting all involved in other people's lives with my own life. Freaking suffering, man. Ain't that something? But instead, I waited more than one drink or up and down the line. So I sat in the station for at least an hour until I saw him through a window. And I walked to the car and noticed that for the first time, my skin wasn't all wet and clammy, man. My hands weren't shaking, my heart wasn't bounding as hard. I sat for the first time right across from him, directly in his line of sight, and I watched for a change in his face. Would he recognize me? If he did, I saw no sign of it, and I was looking hard. We must have been like a nice little couple men sitting across one another that afternoon, staring at and into one another. It was hard not to let the rage in front of the rage I felt like come out on my face man but with a lot of effort I was able to keep it still and expressionless and expression none of this and expressionless <laughs> inside I was practically like screaming at him react to me man look at me see me man I know you for what you are but I didn't do. In my little quiet command, the master, you know, wasn't answering. Not the first trip around, or the second, or the third, or the tenth. We were all far into the night together. And at each other terminal, we get out together and waited. And I sat right beside him on the bench, watching him from the corner of my eye. And still got nothing from him. But two could play at that game as well as one. Now finally, we made our last trip together. I had him and I knew it. Last trip of the night before the train started running. I always let him get away from me at this point. Because the inner line is a long way from my home. It must have started running at the same time as the subways. But this time I was going to follow him. Finally see what he was. And when the train started running, I guess some answers maybe.
stranger than most down there react and the car stood still when the doors open and I could dearly hear the last few stragglers making their way out of the station somewhere behind us for all footsteps like just echoing away in the quiet and nothing the speaker system thing to let it rock anyone like who was like half asleep know that we reached the, the terminal was still nothing found I can't footsteps again a conductor or something popping his head in each car to make sure it was empty before taking a train wherever it goes for the night I didn't take my eyes from that quiet from that quiet stupid looking guy sitting in front of me I managed to see the conductor from the corner of my eye I reached out car he looked in his eyes looked over us and a puzzle, like a confused look came on his face. He blinked a few times and paused, and I waited for him to speak. In a moment stretched, in a moment like stretched out, but then, with like a quiet shake of his head, like, it's like he left. And there was a car ahead of ours, and I heard him stop being ejected too. Then a few minutes later, the train started up again, and we were all for a time, and then looked around in the subway was parked. I could see into the, um, I could see into the windows of more trains on either side of us and through the opposing windows into even more. And then he smiled at me. It was just a small, light curl of the lip that would have gone unnoticed if I hadn't spent the last several hours studying his face. So, he said in a real rough, like deep voice, Here we are. I tried to respond, but I couldn't right away, man. My throat had clamped shut. I was scared, man, more scared than I ever been of anything in my whole life. It felt like the whole underground, you know, the cave we was in just collapsed on top of me. And I coughed and kind of <coughs> finally managed with a raspy voice to, to ask a question that kept me up at night, drove me half crazy, and led me to where I was right now. I said, what are you? He just ignored me and stood up and the train doors open. And then he turned to face me and said, I'm coming. He didn't wait for an answer but walked out onto the platform and I scrambled real quick to follow him. Come on, man. I shouted to him, talk to me. Who are you, man? What? Why do you had to train all day? That boy. He didn't look back or slow down, man. I couldn't see his face, but it's safe to guess that he didn't react at all. No more than he had anything else. And I followed after him. And I'm still shouting out him, man, but eventually I gave up. I guess the few little words was all I was gonna get up out of him, man. We walked along the platform until we came to a junction. There we turned. And now we was like, you know, um, like what you call it, um, perpendicular to the trains around us. And the path ahead was lit from above, but I couldn't see where it ended. And the trains on either side of us went on forever, as far as I could tell. And far too many trains to serve one city. Ain't no reason why we get all these dang trains, man. And um, it would have mattered by the end, I figured, but I probably should have paid more attention to that at the time. I'm not sure how long we walked. I had a watch once, but it broke. And I took my cell phone out at one point, but got no reception down here. All it would show me was no signal. And the stranger would stop every now and then and look at the subway car for a minute or two, but then pass on. It took me a while to figure out why, but eventually I saw that they weren't all the same. Long lines of them would be simpler, and then we'd come to a different model. It'd be a little bigger or a little smaller, or have a slightly different shape of the cockpit or whatever you call the front part where the conductor sit. It was like different as well, but you know, just a little bit. I didn't, and I don't know what exactly he was looking for, but eventually he must have found it because we turned again, and the subway doors opened when my, like, guide stopped in front of them, and we came in and took our seats. 
I say, look, man, she wouldn't say something now. No answer. I said, I have a frustration. And, like, seriously, what is the pros and cons? I punched it right in the face. You know what I'm saying? Like, the lights of the car came on. And I heard the engine starting up. And I'm like, what? And he gave me a look. And the look he gave was almost sad. And he said, You're not going to be able to go back. What are you talking about? Go back well. And he didn't say nothing. Bro, I'm like, This man's tripping. I'm finna bust his dang head open. If he keep playing this dang freaking dang mommy monster game with me, man. And the train started moving and pushing off in the opposite direction. Then the one we came from, I think. And just this endless parade of them had thrown my sense of direction off. And it rolled for a few minutes and then started to slow down as we approached the stop. Now this man is freaking just there like kind of got sharp or like he was maybe staring at something and not just into nothing. And for the first time I got the sense that he was actually looking at me rather than just looking in the direction I happened to be in. Be still. Be silent. Don't get their attention. The train stopped and the doors opened and they began to flood in. I don't know what I noticed first. The weird clothes, the two long arms with hands that almost brushed the floor, the jet black eyes and angular faces, or the blue gray hue of their skin. My eyes turned it all. Those different like stimuluses and stuff. Before long, second, my brain refused to like process all the different stuff I was seeing. And when it finally did, I was barely able to bite down on the screen. I tried to tear its way from my throat. I thought my heart was going to explode. Shoot, I thought I was going to explode. I was like a dang guitar string. Everything in me was just shaking. Shaking and vibrating. My sight like got dizzy. And I wish I was thankful for. And I vomited. And my mouth was clenched shut. And I forced myself to swallow it. Barely swallowed it back down, man. And my instincts were screaming his words at me. Like be still, be silent. Don't catch their attention. That day was a blur. We rode the subway car up and down the line, still and expressionless for hours, for days, maybe. And it seemed much longer than the line I knew. The line I followed the stranger along, and the hideous things around us seemed to pay us no undue attention. Though we must have stood out like crazy, man. I was so, like, mouth petrified. We fear that when we finally returned, Endless freaking cave of trains. It was just us. I just busted into tears, man. And I fell to the floor and just cried, man. With the stranger watching. When I finally got control of myself, I looked at him. Take me home. Please. I can't. He told me. Don't know which of these will lead you back, if any of them do. He stood and walked out onto the platform, and I got up tired and followed him. He spun around real quick. I think you followed me enough. The rage I felt for him before, that the panic, that the panic had temporarily buried rose up in me. What? I ran to him. I grabbed him by the shoulders and would have, like, I didn't even know I was this strong. I slammed him up against the side of the train. I said, boy, man, you, how I'm out of you, blankety, blank, blank, blank. What did you do to me? I slammed him again and again. Take me back. And he took it all. Like, just took it. And soon that big flare up of anger just kinda, you know, just went away, man, leaving me hollow. Please, man, please take me home. The 
That's not how it works, he said. If we stay together, it's more likely that we'll be noticed. Go your own way, be still and be subtle. And they'll think that you're one of theirs. How could you do this to me, man? Why? He gave me another almost sad look. I had to. You will too. You get stuck sometimes. He pressed my hands off his shoulders and turned to walk away. I fell to my knees suddenly out of strength and watched him leave. At the junction, he turned to face back to me. I'm sorry. And then he was gone. I stayed there on the cold tiles for a long time. I curled up into a ball and cried. After there weren't any tears left in me, I eventually managed to get some sleep. And when I woke, the subway train I come in was gone. Off carrying more blue gray abominations to wherever blue gray abominations go. I couldn't handle going back there anyways. I tried to find my way back to where I started to find a subway that I recognized. I wasn't really sure what direction I should have been going in anymore. I walked for an hour and then another, and finally I found one that might have looked familiar. Or well, I was desperate enough to imagine that it did. And when I stopped and stepped up to the door, it opened for me. And I took a seat and it started up. And in spite of being a lifelong person, agnostic, agnostic, Somebody, they basically, I'm like, I don't believe in God, I believe in myself. But I prayed my heart out. And then the train slowed to a stop. And the doors opened. <coughs> and for a second, I thought I was saved. People, human beings. I'd be the most devout man in the world. And then I noticed the eyes, specifically the third large eye in the center of their foreheads. Yes. 
is hard and you're gonna walk right into somebody and as I did I slammed into someone a woman that fell to the ground without thinking I reacted like a New Yorker would hey stupid trick watch where you going I realized my mistake even before she did her eyes got real like confused and when she really noticed me they bossed out with horror she let or floated quickly back from me and let out some scream like thing. A little more like a howl than a scream actually. But I got the point. Further down the turn I saw the alien three eyed heads turn into orders. I thought suddenly about all those sharp filthy teeth and just like that I was running. And the subway train wasn't there and there was a walkway along the tunnel for the repairman I guess and that's uh we used it wrong from anyways and I took it at full speed and just kept running until each breath felt like getting stabbed and I stopped man just breathing out hard I looked back at the tunnel's curve so I couldn't see the light any longer but it didn't look like nobody was following me but going back that way was not an option <laughs> Now I continued forward in the dark for a long time. Eventually I came to a small opening in the wall and stopped out for a rest. I was hungry, I was saying, in a full speed terrifying run at all. It left me absolutely drained. I probably would have cried again, which seemed to be all I was capable of lately, but it just seemed like too much work. I sat against the wall, legs splayed out, and I imagined I was beating that dang stranger to death with a hammer. It made me feel good. I heard a rat shuffling around in the dark, and every little often I would kick out a foot to scare it away. But after that time, I didn't even bother with it. Rabies and disease it might be carrying would be a blessing compared to endlessly traveling through the subways of strange worlds, lost and all by myself. And when it crept near me again, I didn't show it. Even when it reached and pressed against my leg, I couldn't bring myself to care. Not until a train passed by and it lights up his car and slid up the cover. I was in the dang cave I was in, and a thing that I thought was a rat. It was red like, yeah, but not as much as it was spider like. If someone had prayed the two of them together, the result of an abomination might have been almost this horrible as the thing that was nuzzling up against my leg. And I screamed and flung myself up from the floor and booted it like a soccer player right into the opposite wall. And, it, and when his back made a grudge sound, man, and I watched it twitch out its legs before the final car passed and darkness returned. And in the darkness, a terrible thought came to me. I wondered if it was edible. I didn't want to, and I gagged just imagining it, but I was hungry. And there was no guarantee that I'd be able to find food in this place ever again. Red Spider was my only option. I had off as long as I could, but in the end, survival trumped squeamishness. I had my lighter, but nothing to light on fire. I picked meat off his carcass and cooked it a little by holding it over the flame, but it didn't help much. Nothing could have. The meat was foul, and foul to anything you can imagine. I've been a desperate for food since. I've been a desperate for food since and eaten many other questionable things, but nothing never been as bad as the red spider was. Looking back on everything, that's when I became a stranger. Before I struggled to reach this prison state, the other had been dang. What I had taken for calm was numbness. A sharp rock turned into a river well over time. Heaven's edge is rounded off by the water, beating over it. And what I'd gone through had done the same. Tearing up and eating. And most in the dark, below an alien world, the last of my edges moved. By the time I left the darkness and came back into the tunnel, I was as expressionless as empty as the one who led me here had ever been. That wasn't the worst of it though. The worst came later, the first time I got stuck. The stranger had mentioned it, but in the state I'd been in, I had hardly noticed. One night at the end of the line, I was asked to lay the train. The world was one of the closer to normal ones. The people were almost human. 
punch back. Yeah, that's how my reflection against the window as I exited. Orange. And I pieced together in the restroom now. It stuck me that I was trapped in this world for some reason. It stuck like I like them as well. Which would be handy if I wanted to take the opportunity to like the subway. Which is possible most times, but requires a lot of care. It is quite overwhelming. Alien worlds are a little revolting, I found. Compare them to your own, but the difference is so crazy that it just makes you sick. So I left the subway anyways, because it was clear I wanted to return into the central hall. What I've been taken to call in the infinite line of subway trains at night. Or any other night, I soon found out. Whatever had let me go, I noticed one working no more. I considered briefly staying, but this place wasn't home, it could never be. Even if they looked like me, their culture was bound to be different. That was a lesson I learned before. Even worlds where the people are absolutely indistinguishable from me, from are fraught with danger. I was once in a world where the people looked just like me, well actually, like Brazilian, but that was more than close enough. I learned the hard way that the gesture that me to me means hello meant something like just terribly insulting. Insulting enough that I had been beaten after death while the crowd looked on with approval. Besides, even if that place had a culture I could fake, I didn't want to stay. I wanted one or two things to find my way home or to find a stranger who set me on his path and beat the dog mess out of him. Nothing else would make me happy. So I wanted to move home. I wasn't sure at all if I could do to some poor sucker what had been done to me. Could I really force someone else to wander the eternal underground like me? It turned out I didn't have to. After a few months, one of them did notice me. Yeah, they began to follow me for weeks. And I very carefully made it seem like I hadn't seen him. The stranger did to me. I was torn between the desire to warn him away and the desire to bring him to the end of the line so I could leave his dismal world already. The last night he followed me to the end of the line just as I was done. He had managed the nerve to sit right across from me though and as soon as the train stopped at the terminal he rushed off. I waited hoping the conductor wouldn't see me. I could continue on, but to no avail. I left the car and the metro rushed off without me. And I cursed inside as I walked around the corner towards the ticket booth. The young man that had been following me attacked. He had a wicked curved knife. It should have caught me by surprise, but I've been traveling throughout the alien world for several years. My reflexes were sharp. We struggled like real viciously, man, before I managed to wrestle the knife from him. I don't know how he got in his neck. I don't think I wanted to kill him. I wasn't really even angry. Remembering my own building rage from so long before. Afterwards, as he laid there, played out, I got mad. And I kicked him repeatedly, shouting, you big freaking idiot, man. I'm just kicking him. You are supposed to <laughs> follow me. <laughs> and I left the scene in the crowd, but not for long. I was that bright and early the next day to catch the first subway in the morning. And that night when I rode to the end of the line, I was invisible to the conductor again. Uh, so I guess you can either kill them or bring them with you if you want to return to the central hub. I was invisible again, bro. Was also a orange hunchback steel. I stayed that way until the next time I became stuck. The next time I killed. That one went a lot faster. I don't wait for her to follow me. Once I was recognized as a stranger, I recognized her as the next one. It made my choice. I won't bring anyone else into this. It makes me wonder though. About the stranger who inducted me. I wonder what he originally looked like and whether he knew he could have killed me. I wanted to apologize.
of the others are so back home and a rare few I came across since I left. Do they kill them or take them? And whichever one they choose, do they consider it a mercy? I can't bring myself to talk to them to ask what they have to eat away and the damn should suffer in solitude. I've killed 15 of them now and I've gotten really good at it. I'm done killing innocents, at least. Before I return to the central hub, I filled a backpack with as much paper as I could cram into it. And I wrote this story over and over again to be left in as many subway trains as I can. A couple thousand messages and bottles cast into the sea of steel rails. This is a request and a warning. My request above is that you find my mother and tell her, her lie. It's a white lie, don't worry. But tell my mama that I love her and that I'm trying to come home. You may give us some hope or a small little piece of peace. I wish it were true too, but here's the thing. I've been thinking of myself. Like Odysseus, lost in her trap. Looking to return a familiar show. I'm lost at sea, I'm lost in endless tunnels in the labyrinth. The difference is important because labyrinths are designed, built, somebody or something made this impossible place, and they must be held accountable for what they've done to me. They cast me 